Hello, and welcome to Region Locked. Nintendo is praised for the many different genres in which it's willing to feature its eponymous Mario. Not only has Mario starred in a variety of popular games ranging from platformers, sports games and educational titles, to puzzle games, shooters, and fighting games. One of the most popular being the variety of Mario RPGs. Fans of Super Mario RPG, developed by Squaresoft for the SNES and published by Nintendo in 1996, had to wait some time for a new Mario RPG title. The next RPG focusing on the mustachioed pipe fitter was Paper Mario in the year 2000, having Mario take on a new form and appearance. The next RPG which concentrated on the classic form of the character would be Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga in 2003, often considered the true successor to Square's earlier take on a Mario RPG. However, prior to Superstar Saga's release, developers Alpha Dream had created another game which perhaps acted as the catalyst to Mario's return to the role-playing realm of turn-based mechanics. That game, which was aimed primarily at a younger audience, is Tomato Adventure. Tomato Adventure was developed by Alpha Dream and published by Nintendo in early 2002 for the Game Boy Advance, exclusively to a Japanese audience. The player takes on the role of Demille, an anthropomorphic hair-like character. The game's setting is a land known as the Ketchup Kingdom, under the reign of the Tomato fanatic ruler, King Abira. Demille has been shunned from society and banished to spend his days in the cliffside Kobori village, being exiled, as with the rest of the villagers, because of their distaste for tomatoes. When the national holiday Tomato Day rolls around, Demille is watching TV when an announcement is made revealing that a machine has been completed called the Supercara Cooker. According to King Abira, this machine would allow for the citizens of the Ketchup Kingdom to remain as children forever. As Tomato Day is a special occasion, Demille is given the opportunity to fight for the chance to leave the village in which he has been confined, just for the day. After winning this right, he explores the nearby toy ruins with his girlfriend Passaran. During their tour of the ruins, the couple are kidnapped by two purple creatures called Boriki and Goriki, who escape in an airship. They drop Demille out of the ship, setting his adventure in motion as he sallies forth to rescue his girlfriend. Passaran is taken to the Gimmick Palace, where King Abira reveals his plans to use her energy to charge the Supercara Cooker. Not only that, but it's revealed that the Supercara Cooker is not a machine intended to keep the entire kingdom young, but instead it will be used to turn the inhabitants into toys. Demille must adventure through the world, taking out the six Super Kids, collecting six toy parts along the way to to grant him access to the Gimmick Palace, so that he can save his girlfriend, prevent the Supercarla Cooker from being activated, and defeat the King. On his quest to save the Tomato Village, Demille is joined by other characters who assist him on his journey. They must battle with enemies using a variety of toy-like weapons called gimmicks. Each gimmick attack is unique in how it's carried out, similar to the special bros attacks within Mario & Luigi. These fall into four categories. Time gimmicks, requiring the player to press a button with the correct timing. Render gimmicks, involving hitting the same button multiple times. Speed gimmicks, having to tap a series of buttons quickly. And Doki Doki gimmicks, which are unique in execution. These different forms of attack contribute to the game's active participation during battles, where unlike most traditional RPGs before it, the player would simply choose to attack and it would be executed automatically without player input. Each character can have four gimmicks selected for use within battle, with each having a limited number of uses. After all uses of these attacks are depleted, they will all be replenished. Each gimmick can also be adjusted to the player's preference. Individually, gimmicks can be given their own difficulty setting, changing the weapon's damage, the higher the difficulty. As you would expect, the higher the difficulty, the harder it is to successfully perform the attack. The player is even able to test how the difficulty will change the attack from their inventory screen. Failing to successfully pull off a gimmick attack will still hit the enemy, however. Gimmicks can also be upgraded with batteries found throughout the journey. After successfully executing gimmick attacks, the player is rewarded a number of stars depending on the gimmick's difficulty setting, contributing to their cool meter, though failing an attack will completely deplete the bar. By filling a certain amount of this bar, a gear will be activated which can be spent executing a cool attack, effectively a team attack which will change depending on which partner is in battle with Demille. The player will obtain not just a variety of different gimmicks on their adventure, but a large 
large array of usable items, as well as gear which can be purchased and equipped. To create new gimmicks, the player has to find hidden items called pacifiers. These can be found while walking around the game's maps, hidden in a variety of places. While individual weapons can be upgraded and gear can be equipped to bolster a character's stats, experience is also earned for each character and they are capable of leveling. During exploration of the game's maps, there's also the possibility of coming across interactive objects, adding more gameplay to the usually minimally participatory portions of RPGs. These include things like timing button presses for jumps, or simply holding a button to make platforms move. Partway through the adventure, a card-based minigame is unlocked called Gimmicka. After unlocking this minigame, it's possible to duel with or obtain new cards from several characters throughout the player's journey. The objective of the game is to reduce your opponent's health below your own, or to zero. There are two types of card. Gimmick cards, based on the various gimmick weapons in the game, used to attack an opponent. These are automatically put on the table and given a rank based on a color seen in the middle of the screen. A higher ranking card will win a round, though green will always beat blue. After gimmick cards are put into play, the player must select a character card from their hand. These cards change the gimmick's stats, such as increasing or decreasing a rank, or changing the attack value. The difference between the attack stat of the two gimmicks in play will be the damage dealt to the losing player of the round. If both cards remain on the same rank, the higher value attack gimmick is deemed the winner of the round. After all of the player's cards in their hand are used, or one player hits zero health, the game is over. Tomato Adventure was the second title to come from the Alpha Dream Studio, being released after Koto Battle Tengai no Mori Bito for the Game Boy Color. Nintendo approached the team wanting them to develop a new role-playing game under the title Gimmick Land, named after the concept of the game's utilization of gimmicky toys to not just have a game based around turn-based RPG mechanics, but also to introduce more active participation from the player in battle. During this phase of development, the game was being produced for the Game Boy Color, and had made significant progress. Only two screenshots are known to exist from the game's earlier gimmick land period, though the title was allegedly close to completion and was almost ready for release. That was until Nintendo released the Game Boy Advance. As the gaming community interest shifted away from the Game Boy Color to the new system, the team was requested by Nintendo to redevelop their game and rename it Tomato Adventure. They had also been instructed to not just rework the quality of the game's visuals and audio, but also introduce a character which would not just reflect the game, but also be easily recognizable and easier to market. In an interview, while discussing how Tomato Adventure came to fruition, Chihiro Fujioka, the game's director, was initially worried about the shift to the new system. However, he also considered this a potential spot of luck, as having a product published on newly released hardware is a good business opportunity. It was also revealed that Gimmicka, the card-based minigame, was created so that the team could test the Game Boy Color's communication features. Originally, players would obtain cards dropped within the world, but Nintendo suggested that this be changed to having the cards be obtained from defeating key characters instead. With the minigame proving to be popular among game testers at Nintendo, this portion of the game was expanded, resulting in shortened dialogue from NPCs to save storage space on the cartridge, allowing the introduction of more diverse elements to Gimmicka. Demille proved to be a popular character within Nintendo, with many making assumptions that he would be a surefire inclusion into the Super Smash Bros. series with the release of Brawl on the Wii in 2008. Masahiro Sakurai, the director of Super Smash Bros., had included Demille twice within polls, asking players who they would like to see added to the game. Despite his double inclusion, he has never made a playable appearance outside of the initial release of Tomato Adventure, though much later he would appear as a spirit within Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. To promote the game's release, Nintendo announced a contest which would see gamers enter a draw for a kilo of famed sweet tomatoes from the Kochi Virtue Valley area of Japan. Superstar Saga actually includes two unused musical tracks within its data. which are clearly based upon Tomato Adventure's title music. One of the title's bosses is also incredibly reminiscent of the Yodotsuri enemies found within the sunken ship of Tomato Adventure. Alpha Dream was formed by Chihiro Fujioka in the year 2000 after his departure from Squaresoft. During his tenure with Square, Fujioka worked as the director for Super Mario RPG, his most prominent role within the studio and thus it is fitting that he would be in charge of Mario's continued ventures into the realm of RPGs. 
Tomato Adventure proved incredibly popular with not just Japanese audiences and critics, but also the team at Nintendo. After gauging the public's response to the game, Nintendo provided Alpha Dream with the rights to develop their own Mario game, which was soon fleshed out into Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga. Superstar Saga has an incredibly strong resemblance to Tomato Adventure, though one major difference between the two was Mario & Luigi's release outside of Japan, plus its incredible popularity, resulting in four sequels. The game was at some point set for release within countries other than Japan. In 2019, a prototype ROM was published online which revealed a Chinese localization had been worked on for release on the iQ system, China's alternative to the Game Boy Advance. This ROM was based on a cartridge which had been sent to the Chinese government for review at a time when the country held a strict ban on video games. For more information on that, check out the Digino Gaming video on gaming within China. While Tomato Adventure never saw localization in the West, Clyde Tomato Mandolin created a set of tools to work on translation efforts for the title, alongside his own translation of the game's items, enemies, attacks, and menus. Some of the game's early dialogue has also been translated, though not enough to deem the game completely playable without knowledge of Japanese. His inspiration for taking on the project came after the completion of the fan translation for Mother 3, wanting to work on another Nintendo-based RPG with a distinctive style. Plus, his online handle is Tomato, which just seems extremely fitting. After starting work on the translation, Tomato came to realize the project would be as intensive as that of Mother 3. In 2010, he had uploaded his tools to allow others to attempt progress on the project, though to little avail. In 2016, Clyde did a live playthrough of the game on Twitch, using a basic proof-of-concept translation so the audience could follow, receiving suggestions on new names for items, enemies, and the like. In December of 2016, he had completed the game on Twitch, updated his patch and his tools, and uploaded them to his blog, Legends of Localization. When speaking on Superstar Saga's remake with Game Informer, Yoshihiko Mayakawa, a producer at Alpha Dream, was asked why the West never saw a release of Tomato Adventure. He responded, Huh. The reason why is the age group we were targeting was a bit too low and a bit too small. We also had some trouble with the battle system, and it wasn't received well at the time of release. Throughout the various interviews conducted for the title, the team would often reiterate that the game was incredibly child-friendly, but that this wouldn't be the only audience who would enjoy it. Despite this, it's very likely that Nintendo had noticed the demographic most drawn to the game in Japan, and considered Mario to be a much more marketable venture to undertake and invest into if they intend to publish an RPG in the West. Thank you as always to our wonderful patrons keeping Region Locked alive as well as Did You Know Gaming Extra. We uh, super duper, super rooper appreciate it. Thank you as well to Clyde Tomato Mandolin for his translation of the game, and in general he's just a pretty great guy to be honest with you. And hey listen, you say tomato, I say tomato, why can't we both just get along?